Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Forest Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging onto our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. Keep you updated with uh, that. And just a couple other uh, uh, quick announcements. Tying back to the, the Hanukkah dinner, for the kids that come, um, we are going to make some macaroni and cheese so that you know there'll be something there that they actually like and, and want to eat. And uh, but that's not for you parents. So I just to warn you on that. Um, and then we're also going to have a Christmas Eve service here on Christmas Eve at six o'clock. So we encourage you guys all to come. Um, you know, we, we want to spend time together, fellowship, and then the next day, just as a reminder, we're having our annual uh, Christmas Day uh, outreach to the homeless in Covina. It's going to be at Covina Park again, and, and we're just asking for a couple of things. Number one, prayers that, that God will bring to people, and you know, every year He does. Um, and, and I can tell you recently, I was over, um, I was meeting Jordan at a doctor's office over there by the hospital, so I got there early and I started walking around the park. And I can tell you, it, it sure seems like the homeless population has grown there. So um, pray that God will bring them, but also pray that they will really feel and touch God in a meaningful way. And what's really cool is I walked into a um, like a mini mart in Kavina about a couple months ago, and in there was one of the guys that, that comes to our outreach. And so I was able to say hi to him and talk to him for a few minutes. So it's really cool what God's doing. So pray that God brings them. Also, we'd encourage you guys to join with us for that. We know that everybody's busy on Christmas Day and we have things to do, but, but I can truly tell you, because I think this is like our eighth or ninth year doing this, there is no better way to start Christmas Day than this way. So I encourage you guys to join us. We have sign-ups for things in the, the back if you'd like to breathe things. What's so cool is there, there are people, that friends that we know, that we don't talk to but one time a year, and it's this. And you know, I just got a text from someone recently who said, hey, hey, what can we bring this year? And, you know, hey, my parents want to do something. What can they do? And so um, and, and invite friends. You know, if people don't know the Lord, this is a great way to show them, you know, God's love in a, in a, in a real and meaningful way. And I think, as we're going to talk about today, I really think that that more than anything is what this world needs um, nowadays. And, and so... Join us Christmas Eve, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service here, then join us Christmas morning so we can go out and show God's love to people. And if you are, if you're available afterwards, we normally get a group of people together and we go have breakfast and just have fun and fellowship and then we go off and, and do our own things. But, um, but I encourage you guys to, um, to join us for that. And, and I, I promise you that Christmas will not be the same. Either way. So we're looking forward to seeing you guys uh, with those things. And I just want to personally thank all the ladies that came out to, to do the tamales. And I want to really thank Lydia for putting that all together. Um, it was a, I don't know all that goes into it, but it looks like a lot of work. So it was, thank you. It was great. It was perfect. The tamales were right at night. Um, we, we dropped off Jordan in, in uh, Glendale. We was hanging out with a friend. And so we were gone for most of it. When we came back, and there were some sweet tamales. That had just been made. I never had sweet tamales, but thank you, Jesus, man. Sweet tamales and a glass of milk is like, you know. And Grandma made some more for after service. Oh, and Grandma made some more for after service. So once I'm done eating them, I'll share them with you guys. But, oh my gosh, that was like heaven on earth. And, and, and so we thank you for that. And, you know, it's kind of funny, Ryder and I, I'm like, hey, we'll go grab a burger. And so we're in Pasadena, we ate a burger. And I'm like, hey, let's go get ice cream. And, and, you know, let's do something different. So let's not go to, like, Baskin Robbins. Let's, you know, Google the best ice cream place in Pasadena. We're going to go there. So we Google this place. That, huh? No, it's, uh, I, like, we Karen. It's something. It's there with the seat. But it's, like, up in the foothills. Like, oh, this is going to be great. It's got five stars. So we walk in, and we look at the menu, and, like, we immediately, like, uh-oh. 
like, you know, the, the flavors are like sweet potato and hibiscus and, and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, no. And, like, you can't walk out because there, there was nobody else in there. So, like, we're stuck. And, uh, and so we got this, like, chocolate thing that had, like, um, chocolate with um, alcohol nibs. I don't know what it was. It wasn't chocolate. But I think it was, like, maybe, like, ground up coffee. So I'm like, oh, man, how could you ruin, you know, ice cream like this? But, um, so I was glad to come home and have some sweet tamales, because, like, at least my sweet tooth got satisfied a little bit uh, this week. So, um, I appreciate everybody for doing that, and, and I encourage you all to come out next year. It was just, it looked like it was a great time for everybody. But, um, I have to be honest with you, late, late this week I changed my message. And I'm sure that a lot of pastors and a lot of churches have changed their message this week based upon the events of, of what happened. And my, my original topic was going to be about lamenting, but I don't think it's a time for us to lament. I really think it's a time for us to think. And with all the change and uncertainty that is going on around us, I think one thing is for certain, that in this world, in this time, nothing is for certain. In one of the articles, it said bodies had fallen outside the meeting room in San Bernardino, California, where a holiday party with about 80 guests had been underway when two people armed with semi-automatic rifles and pistols walked in and sprayed the crowd with scores of bullets. The headline on CNN said, Carnage was unspeakable, police said. I'm sure you're all aware 14 people died and 21 people were wounded. Some of them are still in critical condition. And for the most part, the focus was on finding the two terrorists and the others that are still out there. And believe me, church, there are others that were connected with them that are still out there. But as I read the articles and I saw the pictures and I heard all the people talking about were they terrorists, were they not terrorists, my focus wasn't on them, on them at all. My focus really was on the 14 dead and the 21 wounded. For those 35 people, that morning started out like any other morning. And I'm sure it's safe to say that it ended differently than any of those 35 ever could have imagined. Now I have to confess that even of the 35, my focus really wasn't even on the 21 that were injured. But my focus truly was on the 14 that died. We're all familiar with John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a scripture that we cling to and it's a scripture that we hope for. But I'm sure a lot of people don't understand that further on in John 3, verse 36, it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does, who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John tells us, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. And this whole week, well, since Wednesday, that scripture was just running through my mind. And the question I kept asking was, did they believe? Did they not believe? Had they accepted Jesus before this happened, and were they seeing life? Or had they not accepted Jesus? And would they not see life? If they hadn't said, accepted Jesus, were they one of those people that said, well, eventually I'm going to get around to it. One day that will happen. Well, but just not now. Or had the world and Satan hardened their hearts so much that they just decided that they weren't going to believe at all? Now, we have a tendency to react when something tragic like this happens. And unfortunately, it has happened more and more recently with Paris and Colorado and now San Bernardino. But church, this tragedy happens on a daily basis. People die tragically, unexpectedly. And when they die, they leave things unfilled and unfinished. And as we as people, and as we as a country, and as we as a world deal with these tragedies, deal with these terrorists, many questions come up. How do we make sense of the tragedy? How do we make sense of the loss? How do we make sense of the fear? Now, I don't know about you, but I can honestly tell you that I have been looking at things differently since Wednesday. 
Especially knowing that there are more out there and more attacks are going to happen. Thursday morning I was at the gym with my friend and I have to confess the whole time I was in there, I was looking and making sure I knew where the exit was because if anything ever happened, I wanted to make sure I could get out of there. It's kind of like when you're on a plane, people always tell you when you're on a plane, you always want to make sure you know where the two exits are in case anything ever happens and you can't see, you want to be able to know if you have to crawl in the dark or in smoke where that exit is. Well, I have begun to find myself doing that same thing. When I walk into buildings or when I walk into places now, I'm beginning to look like, does there seem to be anything that seems unusual here? Does there seem to be anybody in here that seems like they might not be up to something good? I can honestly tell you that we as people and we as a country are beginning to sense that fear maybe that other parts of the world have sensed for a long time. And here my heart church, I actually believe that it's good that we sense that fear a little bit. I think it's good that we heighten our awareness. I think it's good that we have our senses on alert. I think it's good that we stop assuming that it would never happen here because it has happened here more often than I think we think. And I think it's good that we begin looking at things a little bit differently. But even as we still deal with Wednesday and the death and the threats of future possibilities. The question is, do we lament? Is it time to lament? Is it time to think? Is it time to act? Well, I was, as I was thinking about this this week, and as I began to pray and really reach into the Word of God about this, I think what it is, is it's time for us to see what the Bible says about how we should act and think during times of uncertainty. So Lord, we thank you for the word. We thank you for your truth, Heavenly Father. Lord, just as we said last week, we thank you that your word and your actions are always the same. Lord, we thank you that in times of uncertainty, Lord, we can still be certain in you, Heavenly Father. Lord, I ask that, that our eyes would be open, our, our hearts would be open to hear you and see you today, Lord. Lord, may your word plant deeply in our hearts. In Jesus' glorious and mighty name we pray. Amen. Now, if you want to stand, we're going to read Ecclesiastes 3. And we're going to read verses 1 through 8. If you don't have a Bible, you can just go ahead and read it off the uh, handout we have for you. And beginning in verse 1, it says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what was planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. You can go and have a seat. Now, I'm sure that this scripture probably sounds very familiar to you, and it's not because we've read it before in the Bible, but as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, this is actually the, the lyrics of a very popular song back in the 1960s, by the birds called Turn, Turn, Turn. But they didn't write it. King Solomon actually wrote it. If you know anything about King Solomon, he was the king that when, when God said, you can have, ask for anything and I will give it to you, he asked for wisdom. Even though his life didn't always necessarily portray it, he was definitely a man of wisdom. And what we see here is that he's telling us that there was an appropriate time for the range of activities that constitutes human life. Of all the things, and there's actually 28 different things that we just read here, of all the things that we read about, I think it's safe to say that if you haven't encountered all of them, you will before your time is up. There are positive events and there are negative events. And actually, as he wrote it, for every positive event, there was a negative event. The possibility, not necessarily that the negative event would happen, but the possibility that a negative event could happen. 
And we see that today. For example, a very positive event is that a lot of people get married. Now, the parallel negative event to that is that we know statistically 50% end in divorce. In that one activity, there's a positive event and there's a negative event. And King Solomon says that to everything there is a reason, a time for every purpose under heaven. What he's reminding us is that everything has its time. Everything has its time. And we must remember that we serve a God of seasons. And we see it in His creation. Now, we probably don't see it here in California as much as other places do, but believe it or not, there's actually four seasons in the year. Summer, spring, winter, fall. And I can tell you when we were in Chicago, we saw some winter. You know, this is, this is their summer, but, but we call it winter. But, but there are four different seasons in the, in the, in the, the, world, in the year where the universe changes, but, but one thing remains consistent, and that is that all, the, wor all the, the world and all the planets resolve, revolve around the sun. And I think it's a good reminder for us that yes, there are different seasons in our lives, but regardless of the changes, regardless of what happens, our seasons in our lives still should result, revolve around the sun, Jesus Christ. That's why in Hebrews 13.8 it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our lives may change, our seasons may change, but they still should revolve around the sun, who scripture tells us never change. And we have to come to grips with the term and the fact that our lives and our world are changing. We see it, we saw it in San Bernardino, and if you ever turn on the news, we see it on a daily basis. You know, it's interesting, I was talking with a guy last week, and he told me, I, I don't turn on the news in the morning anymore. And I asked him, well, why not? He said, because it's always negative. And I have found that if I turn on the news in the morning and I get bombarded with all this negative news, it has a negative impact on my day. And I'm not quite as happy. I don't have that optimistic outlook as I should. So I choose no longer to listen to the news. Not to, I, I don't really listen to news either. I turn on you know, ESPN or, or something like that. But, but I thought it was a really good point. We are bombarded with negativity all around us. And what I told him is that, you know, I agree. Don't turn on the news. The first thing you should turn on is the channel to God. You know, spend time with God. Pray, pray to God. Praise God. Because what I've found is when I turn on God first, that has, seems to have a positive impact on my life. But we have to come to terms and grips with the fact that our world is changing. There is more negativity than ever. There is more uncertainty than ever. And because of the, the people in this world, we have to admit that there is more fear in the world than ever. For us adults, and I'm going to be 50 this year, if you look back on your childhood, it is safe to say that the world has changed. It is not the same. I remember my first day of kindergarten walking home by myself. We would never allow a kindergartner to walk home by themselves anymore. I remember when I was a young kid, my friends and I, we would go off on our bikes for hours and just go to parks and everything else. We would never allow our kids to do that anymore. The world has changed and we have to accept that. But we also have to accept that there's one thing that has not changed and that is Jesus Christ. We shouldn't let our lives and our thoughts revolve around the world. We must ensure that we have our lives and our thoughts revolve around Jesus Christ. And we see, when we see things like what happened in San Bernardino, when we read things and see things on the news, we must, must remember that with these changes, everything has its time. Everything has a purpose. Clear skies give way to cloudy skies. And we know that storms will eventually go away. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Everything has a time. Yes, we can say that sometimes those activities are deliberate and willful acts, but we can also take comfort in knowing that those deliberate and willful acts done by people, those people will be held accountable by God. So when we see things that happen, like Wednesday, and other things in the world, we must take comfort and know that everything has its time. 
Hear my heart, am I saying that God did what happened on Wednesday? Absolutely not. Am I saying that God did what happened in Paris? Absolutely not. But what I am saying is even when those things happen, we must remember that God is still in control. And that everything that has happened and will happen has its time. There was a newspaper in New York that came out with the, the headline this week that said, God isn't fixing this. And it was a response to all the, the politicians that, that tweeted out and stuff saying, our prayers are going with the people that died. Our prayers are going with the families. Our prayers are going with the people that are hurt and, and in the hospital. And this is this. And I can't remember what it was. The Daily News in New York came out and said, God isn't fixing this. In other words, they were suggesting we need to stop praying and we need to start doing things. In other words, they're saying if God really was fixing this stuff, this stuff wouldn't happen. And then I was reading the news and there was a gentleman who was a, a, the L.A. leader of the Council on American Islamic Relations who was doing an interview with CNN this week and he says, let's not forget that some of our own foreign policy as Americans as the West have fueled that extremism. He's basically saying that we and what we do and what we decide and how we act are just as responsible for what happens in this world as the terrorists are. And I have to tell you, I was appalled by that statement. And what even made me more appalled was the interview for CNN said absolutely nothing about it. Just so we're clear, we are not responsible for what is happening in this world. We are not to blame and we are not going to make excuses for terrorists to shoot people and blow up people. Yes, everything has a time. But we must remember that everybody will be held accountable. Everybody likes to blame God when things go wrong. And we've seen it since the beginning. Adam blamed me. Adam blamed God saying, you were the one that gave it to me. And we're still doing it today when we say God isn't fixing us. But I believe that that might be part of the problem. They were too busy blaming everybody else and not taking responsibility for our own actions. So as we see things like Wednesday and other things in the world, we must remember that everything has its time. And in verse 2, King Solomon says, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. <coughs> he said, there is a time to be born and there is a time to die. But what's interesting and some people have noted that he doesn't mention anything in there about a time to live. Showing just how short and meaningless it is unless we're focused on the right things. We have absolutely no control over when we are born. And if we live our life according to God and in His will, we have absolutely no control over when we die. But I think that one half of that sentence there shows us just how fragile life truly is. We as humans and we as society have a tendency to pat ourselves on the back and, and, and really praise ourselves for all the accomplishments that we have made and all the things that we have mastered. Yes, we are involved in the development of life. And yes, through medical advancements, we have been able to prolong life. But even with our involvement, we still have no control over life and over death. Yes, we have mastered many things, but this one sentence reminds us we don't have control over time. Many people want to ignore death. Death is coming, we know that, but we try very hard to put it out of our mind as long as we can. And I'm sure even those 14 people knew that death was coming. But I don't think they realized it was coming as quickly as it did. When we're confronted with the time of death, 
in a time of tragedy. We must remember that each moment is God appointed. God determined my birth, March 7. And God and only God will determine my death. Now I have to preface that because Ryder and I were talking about this a little bit. And he's like, if God appoints everything, then why should we eat healthy? Why should we work out? We should do whatever we want. And I, I preface that by saying, as long as we are within God's will, it is up to God to determine our time of death. Now, yes, God determined my time of death, but I still will not go bungee cord jumping or skydiving. Because I don't want to take that into my own hands. And if you've ever seen in your own life, God gives us the freedom to take things into our own hands. And I'm not going to take into my time of death into my own hands. So even though God determines our time of death, I encourage you to eat right, be healthy, you know, don't try to catch a bullet with the hand, none of that stuff. We need to do and live inside of God's will. But if we are within God's will, it is up to God to determine our time of death. That's why you see healthy people dying all the time. That's why you see other people that do every bad vice known to man that live to be 110. And that's why we can't make sense of any. Because it is up to God and only God to determine our time of death. It is up to God and only God to appoint each moment. So if God has control between our life and our death, then what do we have control over? Well, we have control over that time between them. And I've told before in, in messages, you know, on, on a tombstone you have a beginning date and an ending date and there's a dash. And it's our dash that we have responsibility for. And it's our dash that we make decisions and choices that affect the ending. And what happens after the ending? So we shouldn't sit here and we shouldn't say, well, if God has control over everything, there's nothing for me to be involved in. Because we absolutely have something to be involved in. We have control over that dash. And more importantly, we have control over the microphones that go out sometimes when you're not expecting them. Hold on a second. <laughs> I didn't think it was that bad, God. <laughs> we have control over the dash. And more importantly, we do have control over a birth. And that is the second birth. God gets to choose and determine when we are born. We get to choose and determine if we will be born again. John 3.3 3 said, Most assuredly I say to you, this is Jesus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We have a choice. Will we be born twice and die once? Or will we be only be born once and die twice? Hebrews 9.27 says, And it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, judgment. Yes, God may appoint and determine our life and our death. But He has given it to us to determine what we do between those two days. Will we choose to live like the world and be a part of the world? Or will we choose to be born again, that second birth? So that we will only have to die once. Now I don't know about you, but there are a lot of people, good Christian people, that fear death. And if you fear something so much, then I say you should only want to go through it once and not twice. I fear going to the dentist and getting, you know, root canals and stuff. If I have a choice of only doing it once, I only want to do it once. He's a nice guy, but I just don't like him. You see, it's up to us to decide, just like those 14 people. And those people in Paris, and those people that die every day. It's up to us to decide what we do. It's up to us to decide, will we be born again? Job 14, 13 says, Oh, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. When we are born again, when we accept Jesus into our hearts, He assures us that He will remember us. As we face death, as we deal with death, as we look at death, take comfort. Because each moment is God appointed. 
And we know through reading the Bible and seeing it happen in our own lives that God's work is eternal. It's perfect. And it's permanent. Nothing can be added from it to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. The promises that God has given us throughout His Word are available to us. When we see tragedy all around us, the promise of peace is still available to us. When we feel despair and pain and suffering, the promise of joy is still there for us. We can take comfort in knowing that through life and through death, that God is still in control. And when it's time for us to die, the Bible tells us that we will stand before God. And that we will be judged not on our own merit, because we have no merit to offer. We won't be compared to God's standard of holiness, because we can never compare it. But the Bible tells us that it's through Jesus and only Jesus that we will be able to enter into heaven. A little bit later in Ecclesiastes 3, verses 14 and 15, it says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before Him, that which has already been and which is to be already been. And God requires an account of what is past. I think one of the most important things that we can do as we look at these tragedies and, and we anticipate and prepare for other tragedies to come, I think the most important thing that we can do is to live as one who is prepared to die. Live as one who is prepared to die. I, I know I've told this story before, but, but one of the most amazing examples I've ever seen of this is my mom. who, When she knew she was going to die, was fearless and confident and at peace. The day of her death, her last meal was Diet Coke and chocolate ice cream. I just want to say, that's exactly how I want to go. I, you know, if I can have ice cream as my last meal, I, was, I, was, I had lunch with Rick this week, and I was saying if I was ever put on death row, my last meal would be Capri Deli, the sandwich there. But, but if I got to go, you know, give me ice cream. She went in peace. She was prepared to die, and she had lived her life if she was prepared to die. <clears throat> now this may sound funny being coming from a pastor, but and I know a lot of a lot of people do it, so please don't get me wrong, I'll, I'll explain what I'm saying, but but I never think about my funeral. Now a lot of people will, will plan their funerals and it was great, you know, it was so funny. Julie, you know, God bless Julie. Julie had planned her funeral with everybody. And as we were getting closer to the funeral, I kept getting these calls from people. Oh, Julie wanted me to tell you that she wanted this song to be sung. Julie wanted me to tell you that she wanted this to happen. And even at the day of her funeral, we're probably about three minutes away from starting, someone comes up and says, Julie wanted me to tell you she wants this song to be played at her service. I'm like, oh my gosh, we don't have any more time, you know? But, but, but there are people out there that really think about and plan their funeral. I have to tell you, I've never thought about my funeral. I will never think about my funeral. And here's why. I'm not going to be at my funeral. I will never know if one person shows up or a hundred people show up. I will never know if the music was good or the message was good or if the food was good. I don't care about my funeral because I'm not going to be there. But what I do care about is where am I going to be when my funeral happens? And that's, I think, the way we should all live. We should live our lives to prepare to die. So that when people come to our funeral, we can be in heaven celebrating as opposed to going, man, it's really hot down here. <laughs> Because we have no control over what is going to happen in this world, because we have no control over when we are going to die, then church, I believe that the Bible is calling us to live our lives as we are prepared to die. If we are going to die today, are we living our lives to be prepared to die? If we are living our lives to be prepared to die, then there is nothing in this world that can scare us. I pray that for those 14 people and the people in Paris and the people in Colorado and the people that are going to happen next time, I pray that they are living their lives as they are prepared to die. Because if they are doing that, then there is nothing that this world or anybody can do that's going to take that, that away from them. 
I believe sometimes we lose focus on them. I believe that if we live our lives as we are prepared to die, then when we die, we will be ready to live. Now, I'm not saying that something bad is going to happen. I believe it's going to happen. I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. But church, I think we have a greater possibility of dying through natural causes. I think we have a greater possibility of, of dying through a car accident. I think we have a greater possibility of, of doing something silly to ourselves. That's why I believe that we must live our lives prepared to die. And if we're going to live our lives prepared to die, then we must make sure that Jesus, and only Jesus, is the center of our lives. I believe one thing that, that Wednesday did for me was to, and, and Jared and Rick, if you want to come up here. Oh, I guess i got to see you too. I, I believe. I feel like I'm going I feel like I'm in a, like a school presentation. <laughs> I believe that one thing that Wednesday taught us was there is an urgency, church, that we all must be prepared to live, to die. I believe that one thing Wednesday taught us is that there is no such thing as tomorrow for us. That's why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will take care of itself. Don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today. My dad used to say, I will, I'm just going to yell. Sorry. My dad used to say, don't worry about manana. Manana never comes to church. I believe we have to live our lives with that same thought. Tomorrow is never going to come. We have to live our lives for today. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, don't assume that you'll have till tomorrow to make that happen. If you're thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm young. You know, maybe in 20 years, you know, I, 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 maybe I'll get right with God. Then you have to assume you don't have 20 years to get right with God. You have right now and only right now to get right with God. We have to make sure we're right with God. The church is also another urgency. We must tell other people about God as well. No, I don't think, you know, you know I'm, not, I'm, I'm not getting political. I don't think we need to talk about more of God gun control. I think we need to talk more about being, God being in control. I think if God is in control, all the other stuff kind of takes care of itself. I think now, even more than ever, we must rise up as a body. As children of God, and I think we must proclaim, Jesus said in Matthew 16, proclaim to all the ends of the earth, to every creature, the word of God. I think we must proclaim it. I think when we're on that, that Christmas parade next week, you know, because we're all so politically right now, and happy holidays, I think we should offend everybody and say Merry Christmas. I think we should tell people that God loves them and watch them cringe. There's no time, church. There's no time to be politically correct. There's no time to be shy. There's no time to be natural. There's no time to wait till tomorrow. Because our tomorrow is here. Our Wednesday is here. I was talking to a guy, and, 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 and you know, he said he's, he's a good guy. He's, he's done a lot of time in prison. And he said, I used to sit in that cell and I'd look out. I used to think there was no future beyond that. But here I'm out. And, and we were talking about Jesus. He really doesn't know Jesus. And he said, I've done a lot of bad things in my life. And, and I don't think that God will ever forgive me. And I said, brother, he forgave you the moment it happened. The problem is you can't forgive yourself. And I said, do you really know Jesus? Have you accepted Jesus in your heart? And he's like, I, I think I know him, but, but I don't think I accepted him into my heart. And I said, here's the deal. Until you accept Jesus into your heart, you will stay in that cell. Because only Jesus can free you from that cell. I told about the, the worship song, Chris Tom, my chains are gone, I've been set free. I said, only Jesus can break those chains that you have placed around yourself. Only Jesus can set you free from that cell of, of unforgiveness that you put yourself in. He's not there yet. He's not ready. But I know God's knocking on his heart. So next week I'm going to go talk to him again. And I pray, church, that nothing happens to him until he has a chance to accept Jesus in his heart. But church, God has put people like that all around us. Every day, 
Every day we are faced with people that don't know Jesus Christ. Every day we are faced with people that mm, maybe might want to make a decision at some point, but they're just not getting around to it. Every day we see people that have done really bad things in their life and just aren't willing to forgive themselves. Every day God gives us an opportunity to make a difference in our life. See, I admire the men and women, the first responders that showed up in San Bernardino. And I admire all of the first responders in the military that show up in crisis because I think it takes a very unique and special individual to do that. But church, we are God's first responders. We see tragedy around us every day and God has called us to be his first responders, to respond and minister to those people. No, it might not be death. No, it might not be violence. But there are people around you every day that are living in darkness, that are living in sin, that believe they're in a cell and they will never get it. I think that not only should we live our lives being prepared to die, but I think we also need to prepare other people that they live their lives accordingly. What if, what if we would have known one of those 14? And what if we knew that person didn't know Jesus Christ? And what if we'd always said we're going to get around to telling them about Jesus Christ one day? We challenge you to don't be bashful, don't be shy, don't be politically correct. I challenge you to tell people about Jesus Christ and let them make that choice. I challenge you, especially during this Christmas season, to not let people forget the reason. I challenge you to be that friend to someone who has no friends. I challenge you to be that glue that helps bring a broken person back together. I challenge you to show someone love who doesn't think they can be loved. I challenge you to show someone forgiveness that can't forgive themselves. You see, when we begin to put things in perspective, church, people may think that God can't fix this, but we can take comfort in knowing that He will. Yes, the world seems to be spiraling out of control. And yes, I do believe that we are closer to end times today than we were yesterday. But we should never forget that God is still in control. God has a plan. God has a purpose. And God is already victorious. And we see that as he hung on the cross. What looked like defeat to the world. We claim and celebrate his victory. As I was telling my friend, it's through, it's through the blood, it's through the pain and suffering that we've been let free out of ourselves. It's through what he did as he hung on the cross that released us of our sin. It's through what he did that allowed God to forgive us and be able to call us his own. through what he did, that we can have entrance into heaven. As I said last week, the key to heaven comes in the shape of a cross. Maybe right now you're not sure where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe it's nice to say, maybe it's good to think about, but, but maybe right now you just haven't been able to make that commitment that you know you should Maybe you kind of, you know, you've done the figures and you've done the math and you figure you probably have another 25, 30 years to, to, to live. And so around year 15 or so, we're going to get right with God to, to make sure everything's okay, just in case we're off and the calculations a little bit. Jesus died on the cross so we wouldn't have to worry. And we wouldn't have to wait. I 
I challenge each and every one of you today that we, if you are not, we need to start living our lives as though we are prepared to die. So that when that happens, there will be no worry or fear. That when that happens, we, live this, we leave this world victorious. challenge you just like me. Don't worry about your funeral. Worry about where you're going to be during your funeral. I challenge you to look at your family and friends differently. Not as people that you want to get along with, but people you want to spend eternity with. Jesus, what he did, did what he did on the cross that we can spend eternity And if you haven't been able to forgive yourself or if you haven't been able to get your relationship right with Jesus, I invite you today to let this be the beginning for you. Let this be the second birth that the Bible talks about. Let this be the moment that we no longer worry about the world, but we worship the Savior. I encourage you as you come up, as they play worship, to take your communion. If you want to get together in small groups, and if you want to pray, great. If you want to pray, we're going to be in the back. Pray for our community. Pray for our church. Pray for our world. Pray for our world leaders. And you pray for yourself. We have first responders here that are waiting and ready. Let Wednesday be a wake-up call for all of us, for our own lives and for the people around us. As Jesus said, let us proclaim the gospel, the good news, to all ends of the earth, to every creature. There's not one person in this world that doesn't deserve to hear about Jesus Christ. Even the bad people, even the sinners. Even the people at work that you can't stand, and, and let's be honest, when you see them walking down the hallway, you turn and walk the other way like, please God, don't let them see me. Everybody deserves to hear about it. It's up to us to talk. The terrorists aren't going to win, church. It's going to be God's arm that rises up. So I challenge you this week to grab your sword. Take it with you wherever you go. And tell them about Jesus Christ. So Lord, we thank you for your word, Heavenly Father. We thank you that even in times of uncertainty and tragedy, Lord, we can take comfort in knowing that you are still God. That you are the still you are still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we can take comfort in knowing that through our second birth, we have eternal life. And Lord, I pray for all those people right now, Lord, that, that don't know you. In this building and in this world, Lord, I pray, Lord, that their hearts would be softened, Lord. Lord, I pray that any walls or barriers would be broken down. Lord, I pray for those 14 and their families, Lord. I pray for the 21 in the hospital. I pray for people all around the world that, that suffer tragically every day. Lord, I pray that, that they are ready. I pray that they are living as they are prepared to die, so that when they die, they can live with you, Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that you give us courage and strength, Lord, to preach the gospel, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would forget about political correctness and shyness, Lord. I pray, Lord, that the only thing that we would be worried about is you and your command to us, Heavenly Father. Lord, just as you did on the, on the cross, Lord, the, the sin in our life, Lord, that, that been washed away. We thank you for that, Lord. And I pray, I pray for those people that have forgotten that promise. I pray that they would be reminded that in you or they are made new again. Lord, even in times of tragedy, I thank you for today. I thank you for tomorrow. I thank you for your promises. I thank you for your truth. And I thank you for the hope and joy that can only come through. Lord, may we always remember that 
that what you have given us, this world cannot take away. I pray that you will give us opportunities this week to share them with everyone. In Jesus' glorious and awesome and mighty name we pray. We hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a Foursquare Christian Church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626 626- 914-3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.